live sports. Honestly, really cool to see a culture and place completely different to that of the U.S. So far, I've enjoyed every single aspect of it. I get to visit a new country, try amazing food, learn about awesome culture. So I can say it's been pretty cool all the way around. It's been an amazing experience. I think uh, one of my favorite parts is uh, getting to know a lot of the guys. You know, we played against each other for four or five years. All off season, you're working to try to be better than them, and now it's kind of a unique experience to be playing together. And because like when you find people who love football the way you love football, it's, it's easy to get along with them. Every day, you just it just feels closer and closer with these guys. This is probably going to be the last game of football we ever play, so I think uh, that'll be reflected in, in our energy and, and focus. You know, this is at the end of the day, it is a football game. Uh, you play hard for the guy next to you. Good things tend to happen. So it's not necessarily any particular scheme or play or any anything like that. Um, just playing American football the way it's meant to be played, which is extremely physical. Um, it makes me really proud to be uh, an Ivy League athlete, to represent not only my school, but the United States in a completely different country playing a sport that I love. It means the world, and it's just such an honor and privilege to be here and to be selected. Uh, it means a lot. You know, I, I take uh, immense pride in being a student athlete from the Ivy League and from Princeton. Um, so, you know, to be representing I the Ivy League in Japan is, uh, is a great honor. Being able to be a part of the movement that's spreading football throughout the globe is tremendous to me and I hope it's a sport that goes everywhere. Really excited to help grow the game in, in Japan and get to go out and compete with a bunch of guys that I've been competing against for five years. And I think it's just awesome that we're over here trying to expand a sport that I love that's given me so much of my life that I can't repay. And I hope we can give that same opportunity to somebody else here in Japan. For the second consecutive year, the Ivy League has embarked on a 6,700-mile journey to the other side of the world for a most unique sporting experience. This afternoon, a collection of Ivy League All-Stars takes on a professional football squad from Japan in Tokyo. It's the Japan National Football Association Dream Japan Bowl today on ESPN. Hi, everybody, and we welcome you to this uh, very unique college all-star game. This is the time of year for it. Alongside Tyler Dady, I'm Alex Vespoli. But this, Tyler, is an experience unlike any other for these student athletes. Just great to hear the perspective from some of the student athletes that are here, the cultural experiences they're going through. But at the end of the day, when you're in between those white lines, it's game on. These guys know it. They've been rivals for a while, but now teammates and for Team Japan, there's some pride that goes for representing Japan as a whole, but also some motivation and some validation for the strides that Japanese football has taken. No Japan team has ever defeated a team from the United States in the 90 years they've played American football over in Japan. A look at the Ivy League roster, 52 players from seven Ivy League programs, only Yale not included. You've got 25 players on this squad who were all Ivy Award winners and 16 graduate students who last year played in Power Five programs, 24 in total played somewhere other than the Ivy League this most recent season. Just shows the immense amount of talent there is in the Ivy League. And mentioned in the intro that for some of these guys, this is the last football game they will play, put it all on the line today. But yeah, some of these guys haven't played in the Ivy in maybe one, two years, but they still know what the pride is of representing this conference. Well, this is a most unique experience, and this past Ivy League football season was a pretty unique one as well. We hadn't seen a two-loss team win an Ivy League championship in 41 years, but in the 2023 season, we saw that, and not only did we see one two-loss team win it, it was a three-way tie between Dartmouth, Harvard, and Yale. Just so much parity in the ancient eight right now, and all the coaches have said that this is the most competitive this league has ever been. You see it. There are no gimme games whatsoever in the Ivy League. It came down to that final weekend, the game. Yale beat Harvard, which allowed Dartmouth as a two-loss team in as well. Saw also those coaching notes, Sammy McCorkle winning in his first year as the Brown head coach, and Tim Murphy, who just recently announced his retirement after 30 years at Harvard, won his 10th Ivy League championship that tied him with the legendary Yale coach, Carm Koza, for the most of any coach in the Ancient Eight, and Yale 
back-to-back -back winners for the first time since those early 80s. We're here at the National Stadium in Tokyo. This is the stadium that hosted the opening and closing ceremonies for the Olympics in 2021. It's the venue that hosted this game a year ago when the Ivy League won 24 to 20 over the Japanese team. You're seeing Team Japan come They've got 60 players that play in the X League, which is the highest level of professional football in Japan. They just recently finished their Super Bowl, their version of it, and so these players have come together, have been practicing through all the elements. You can tell it's a little bit of a sloppy field today. They've gotten some rain here in Tokyo over the course of this week. Temperature should be in about the mid-40s. Good football weather here for these players, and they are supremely motivated, as you said, to finally knock off a team from the birthplace of American football. You just look at that field right now. It just feels like a ground-and-pound type day, dirty, on-the-ground, physical battle of the trenches. And yeah, for these Japanese players, there really is no greater honor, no matter the sport, no matter the country, than representing your country at the highest level. And to play at the national stadium is something that is not lost on these players. And there is a strong following for this sport in Japan. Uh, the Rice Bowl, as it's called, the Super Bowl of the X League, regularly draws over 30,000 fans at the Tokyo Dome, where that game is annually staged. As we said, it's been played for 90 years, and there is a, a lot of appetite for Japanese football and the NFL, which at times in the past has played exhibitions over in Japan, and hey, might again soon. And this is one of those steps to helping build the sport, having a trip like this for the Ivy League to come over, share the cultural experiences, and then of course play this game. Of course, it just continues to grow in Japan, and you just see what it means for these Ivy League players to be here back-to-back -back seasons. But for this Japanese team, you have some carryovers from last year's team as well. There is some chemistry. These guys have been working together for a while. The chemistry will be key. It'll be something that we talk about throughout this game. These teams have never really played together. They've practiced for about a week or so. Might be a little bit jagged at times in the execution, but uh, no doubt the motivation is there. The talent is on hand. And if it's anything like we saw last year, should be a competitive game. Uh, but a game with a lot of unknowns. Yeah, exactly. And you just don't know when it comes to play calling when, again, that word chemistry. You don't know the plays. You've only had such amount of time to go over them. And now we will step aside for the national anthems of both the United States and Japan.
We mentioned this is the second consecutive year that this game has been staged, the Ivy League and a Japanese All-Star squad. Let's relive what happened one year ago when these teams met at the National Stadium in Tokyo. What a venue to be playing in. Hosted the Olympics, the opening and closing ceremonies here at the National Stadium. And today it's hosting American football. If there is an embodiment or a visualization of the one Ivy slogan, it's on display here today. These players have been competing against each other for the last four or five years. Now get a chance to play together as teammates with a shared goal of knocking off a team from Japan. We locked in. We locked in in Japan, 9,000 miles away. National Stadium, almost that time. This was more than just an exhibition game for these players. Every opportunity you get, go to work. Let's do what we do, man. Hey, like I said, gang, the game bigger than ourselves. Bigger than our league, it's American football. You guys are awesome. Let's finish the deal. Let's go. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. We are underway. They take the handoff. An incompletion. Khalil Dossi now under pressure. In some trouble and just goes down. The Ivy League defense holds. Jake's free from some tacklers. It's a reverse. Lover gets it back to Malcolm, and he's going to work his way inside the 10-yard line. He gets the handoff and gets into the end zone. Touchdown, Ivy League, Allen Smith. There's an interception. Mike Flugel has it. Let's go! Plenty of time. Glover throwing deep. He's got a man. It's Cragen. Lover sets up for a deep toss. He's looking for Cragen. He's got it at the 30. There you go. Come on. Malcolm the handoff. He gets three on the right side and dances in the end zone. has not trailed since 3 nothing, so they really haven't had a, a drive with a lot of pressure on it until now. Ivy League offense will take over at the 41-yard line. He'll look to run it again. Pass space, Glover spinning inside the five, reaches out, and he's got a touchdown. Big time drive for the Ivy League, and a lot of it coming from Glover. Need about three and a half yards here on fourth down. Fakes the handoff, has time. It's incomplete. Japan down by four. And that is how this game will come to a conclusion. The Ivy League travels to Tokyo and comes from behind to knock off the Japanese All-Star team by a final of 24 to 20. Good job. You guys are good, bro. Let's keep it going. It's really good. It's really good for football. Yeah, that's very Really good. Yeah. Right? Travel time. Right. Thank you. Yep. Um, honestly, I just had a, a lot of fun. I thought it was a great experience. Both sides gave it their all, and I thought it was an, an excellent matchup. And I'm just thankful to, to get that opportunity to be able to play here in Japan. This is an awesome experience, and uh, Japan has become a very competitive football program. Um, everyone came out there, they played the hardest, and uh, we're super grateful for the experience and super grateful to uh, be able to come out here and uh, you know expand American football past just the United States. Being able to expand and bring the game over to Japan just shows how global American football has become. We're becoming trailblazers, and I think you know starting here with this uh, halfway across the world is a, is a great start. Well, the Ivy League team touched down about a week ago in Tokyo. They were able to take in a, a lot of cultural exchanges, 
in addition to getting some practice time in and got a chance to explore and enjoy their time in Tokyo and in Japan and of course get ready for this football game. The Ivy League coaching staff is the Brown coaching staff led by former Brown quarterback James Perry. Meanwhile for the Japan team it is Hiroshi Yamamoto who is coaching the Japanese squad for the second consecutive year. You will hear the officiating crew and the, the penalties will be announced in English. So if you were concerned, uh, or do I need to know my hand signals for the officials? Uh, that's been taken care of. They play with NCAA rules for the most part over in Japan. And so it should be pretty easy to follow. Uh, it should be more par for the course as far as college football fans are concerned. Hey, it'll be interesting to see what kind of wrinkles there are defensively and offensively for Japan, things that these Ivy League players haven't seen before, their take on some play calling. But again, we went back to it. Chemistry, play calling. We can only do so much with so many brand new faces. Might be a little bit vanilla at times, but a lot of this game will be decided on the ground, especially with the conditions. The captains for the Ivy League team, Alex Washington, a cornerback who played at Harvard, also played most recently at Boston College. And offensively, the captain for the Ivy League squad is Dartmouth's Nick Howard, who was there at quarterback for the last few years for the Big Green. The lone captain, although you see a couple of bodies up there for the Japanese team, Taku Lee, a running back from Nyoga, Japan. And he played in the Dream Bowl last year. And here we are in the Dream Japan Bowl. There are a few holdovers from last year's Japanese team who are coming back to playing in this game. Of course, for the Ivy League squad, it is entirely new uh, this experience for all 52 of these players. And what's so important as well is for Japan, returners on the offensive line. Four from last year, including three starters. When you watch that recap, a lot of it was the pressure that the Ivy League was able to institute, getting into the backfield and then on the other side, the Ivy League had clean pockets to pass in. Ivy League winning the coin toss and deferring, so it will be Team Japan that will receive the opening kickoff. In the X League, we mentioned it, it's the highest level of professional football in Japan. It is more than 50 years old and a lot of teams, 55 teams over four different tiers. They've got promotion, they've got relegation, they play in the fall, it's a short season, only five games, and they usually play with 12 minute quarters. That is the really the lone difference between what they play with versus NCAA college football. This might just be the soccer fan of me talking, but love promotion relegation. I mean, how many teams are there that really just doesn't feel like they have ambition? And prom promotion relegation systems, there's always something to play for. There's financial implications as well. So always motivation for this Japanese leagues. Mentioned the head coaching matchup. James Perry coming off his best year leading the Brown Bears. They showed significant improvement this past season, and he's got that Brown program starting to hum. It's taken a little while to get there, but he's doing tremendous work at Brown. Meanwhile, Hiroshi Yamamoto, basically a legend in the X League, and he's still a fairly new head coach. He's only been coaching for five seasons, but look at that record and four championships already. Yeah, it's eye-popping, just the success he's had. It's a dynasty that he is setting up. And for James Perry, you had mentioned it, this Brown team starting to trend forward. Play calling wise, he was a quarterback. He's more the air raid type guy in the combination he had with Jake Wilcox and Wes Rocket this year, one of the best combinations in the Ivy League. Taku Lee is back to receive. And the kickoff coming from the Ivy League and Jackson Kennedy, and here we go from the National Stadium in Tokyo. The run back for Lee, he'll get out across the 20 before he gets brought down on the tackle for the Ivy League squad. It's Matt Cavanaugh, linebacker from Harvard University. A good chance for Japan. We said there's motivation, absolutely. Get the ball first, try and score, try and put an imprint on this game immediately. And so, Yuki Masamoto will lead the Japanese All-Stars team. He plays for IBM Big Blue in the X League. He was the backup quarterback last year in the Dream Japan Bowl. He takes over starting nod is a 29-year-old and the lefty tosses over to the left side. Catch is made and run out of bounds is Junpei Gimoto. And we are off and underway here in the Dream Japan Bowl. Caleb Moody, Harvard safety on the tackle. Yeah, what a year that Caleb Moody had in that Harvard secondary. And Harvard, a team that had so many fresh faces. There was a lot of question marks 
going into Tim Murphy's final season, but they delivered in a big way. Get an official's time out here quickly. Gunpei Kimoto, who made that catch, plays for the Nojima Saga Mahiara Rise. This is a roster that features 60 athletes. Six are student athletes that play for various universities over in Japan. It might be a little tough to see the lines. We did receive a lot of rain in recent days. It's washed out some of the lines, but you can see set up just beyond the 30-yard line, and it's uh, second and two here for the Japanese team. And making sure the clocks are all operating. This is the first mm -hmm. time in a while that football, American football, has been played. You see there's been a bit of a soccer setup as well with some of the other lines. We have a game clock operation trouble again. Please let us take it. And so a couple of issues with the game clock. But Yuki Masamoto for IBM Big Blue had a good season. Masamoto... Played in five games, threw 100 passes, completed 64%, seven touchdowns. He was eighth in the X League in passing yardage and sixth in touchdown passes. IBM Big Blue looking for their first Rice Bowl championship. As we mentioned, it's been the Fujitsu Frontiers and their head coach, Hiroshi Yamamoto, who has done a wonderful job leading that team. And they're... There's a lot of representation from that team on this squad, 24 players from Fujitsu lining it up for Team Japan. Yeah, why not? They've been the gold standard of the league, so it only makes sense when you have a group of all-stars that it comes right from the top. We talked about how no team from Japan has ever defeated a team from the United States. Japan has beaten 100% of the competition it's played other than the United States and Canada. Uh, they have won world championships in 1999 and in 2003. The USA notably did not participate in those tournaments. Japan did lose in a title game to the United States in 2007. That was a game that went double overtime and in 2015. So they have a history of going against American teams, and they want nothing more than to validate where they are as a football power by defeating this Ivy League squad here. It left a bitter taste in their mouths, the game that they played last year. They lost 24 to 20, and you know, just reading in the press, uh, a lot of disappointment that even though it was close, they really felt like they should have won that game. It just shows you as well, this isn't just for the pageantry, this game. There is big things on the line, huge implications for Japan. A handoff, and this is Samaji Grant who has the first down. Grant from Compton, California. He is one of those foreign players that plays in the X League. Each team is allowed to have four. No more than two can be on the field at any given time. And Grant is a bit of a wide receiver, running back hybrid. Figures to be a key part of the Japanese game plan. He was the MVP of the Rice Bowl earlier this month. On first down, it's completed across the 40. And again is Gimoto, his second catch. Short gainer here sets up for a second and long for Team Japan and Yuki Masamoto. Yeah, Masamoto just trying to get into a little bit of a groove here. A couple of quick hitters, both to Gimoto, and obviously you want to get the ball in the hands of Samaji Grant. He was the MVP, like you mentioned, in the Rice Bowl. More than just what he did on the ground, also had a halfback pass. He can really do it all, so he's always a threat. Watch you out for him. Setting up at the 42-yard line. Again, it's Grant. Spins out of a tackle, and he'll be brought down. It's once again Caleb Moody and his Harvard teammate jumping in on the fray, Anthony Nelson, a graduate student who spent this past season and the season before playing for the Blue Devils at Duke University. Well, right there, you're wondering why Harvard's wearing blue uniforms. That was four Harvard players in the area. The Crimson have... Eight players on this roster, including five on defense. So it might not be the last time that you see a host of Crimson who have sported an excellent defense the last few years in on a play. On third and long, it's a screen. Grant has it, and he will be just shy of where he needs to get to. So he's out to the 48-yard line, needs to get to the 49-yard line. And 
and Japan keeping its players out there on the field. It is fourth and one. And the give, looked like James Perry might have been trying to call for a timeout, but that is enough for Grant to get a first down. It's all about Samaji Grant. Catches a pass, couple of runs as well in that sequence. And where he's so good in the backfield after contact, just a couple of delays he's had. He lets the play develop in front of him, and then he's able to find the hole. Grant played at the University of Arizona. He graduated in 2017 and has found second life as his football career continues. And so does this drive. Gamoto gets into Ivy League territory down to the 47. Uh, Gamoto, pretty soon they're going to have to focal point him. That's already three catches on this opening drive. They've all been quick. We had a screen pass, couple underneath, just getting to that second level. Nice chunk plays on first down that is really getting this Japan offense ahead of schedule. Three wide receivers for Japan. They fake the handoff. Masamoto throwing on the run. It's incomplete. He was looking for Akihiro Ota, the tight end. A second year student at the University of Tokyo. Now check that, that's actually Riki Matsui. Wide receiver, played for the Fujitsu Frontiers and they cannot come up with the connection. Yeah, Carson Winky was immediately in the backfield here. This is a nice touch, kind of where you need to throw that pass up, let the tight end get through it. And a quick snap, Japanese team is not taking a long time between plays as this is a run for Nanato Nishimura running back for the Obik Seagulls. And it's third down for Japan. Opening drive of the game, nearly four minutes in. So glad you could join us for the Dream Japan Bowl. Second annual, we'll see if it's an every year occurrence, but second consecutive year this game has been played. They gave him enough for the first down. Need to get down to the 28 yard line. On first and 10. Masamoto floats it, and it's just too far out in front once again for Matsui, who is a returning starter from last year. He was an all-X League player this past season, so as far as star wide receivers, we've seen a lot of action to Kimoto, but Matsui is possibly the go-to guy if you just take a look at the credentials of where these Japanese players stand. Matsui had a quote that it's important to beat the United States. He wants to win his 1v1 match, and he's getting a lot of one-on-one -on -one coverage, and they're trying to find him. Masamoto that time is Washington right on him. It's Samaji Grant again. He finds a bit of a hole, keeps moving forward, and he will be very close to the first down. As right now, Japan looking very strong in this opening drive. And we've seen a little bit of off tempo from the Japanese team. We're also seeing a nice steady balance of offense, mixing in the passes, but also calling Grant's number and getting these big chunk plays. Masamoto running the no huddle. He's got Grant once again in the backfield. On third and one from the 29-yard line. Samaji Grant hits the hole. He's off and running. Grant looking around. He scores. Touchdown, Japan. On a 29-yard run for Samaji Grant. And a brilliant start for Japan in the Dream Bowl. Well, what do we say when they got the ball first? Do you have some motivation going into this game? You want to beat the Ivy League and the United States as a whole? Deliver the first punch in the game. That's what they did. March down the field. Nice sustained drive. Converted a couple of third downs, and it's really only fitting that Samaji Grant to finish it off. At the end of that run, it looked like he was trying to find somebody to try and fight off. Slowed his roll before the end zone. The extra point from Koji Noso is good. And Japan makes it a 7-0 start here in the Dream Japan Bowl. You just see, he's so patient, finds the hole, lets the play develop, and then he is off to the races. He has a look around. And again, like you said, he was trying to find someone to fight off. No, he hits the gap with speed, high steps by one, and then he can waltz his way into the end zone. This is a player that has so much momentum coming from this last season, such a storied year in the X League, and he's taken it here against the Ivy League early. It looked like John Pupil, the Dartmouth safety, who was the player closest to getting to him, but was caught up a little bit in the traffic. You take a look at Samaji Grant, not only was the MVP of the Rice Bowl this past year, rookie of the league in 2019, and of course a 
college football career at the University of Arizona. He was an undrafted free agent with the Detroit Lions after his college career ended. He was a wide receiver who played at Arizona, then he switched to running back out of necessity as a senior. You know, Pac-12 honorable mention in 2016, racked up over 100 catches, so you know he has that ability to be a threat out of the backfield and pretty tough to bring down on the ground. He is very shifty, and when he gets that second effort and that second level speed, tough to catch up to. No, so the kickoff, and this will be run back out of the end zone by Tyson Edwards, former Columbia running back, and does not appear to be a great decision. Only makes it out to the 13-yard line. Well, he said, I didn't come all the way to Japan for a touchback, so trying to get what he can, but good pursuit by the Japanese special team in our first look at this Ivy League offense who's trailing early. So we'll see who comes out at quarterback. You'd expect it to be Nick Howard, who is a bruising running quarterback for the Big Green. And in fact, it will be the Green Bay, Wisconsin native leading the Ivy League squad out of the huddle. So interesting to see all these Ivy League student athletes with their school helmets competing as one team. Seven of the eight Ivy League schools here participating. And first play is a handoff across the 15-yard line to Edwards at a Flower Mound, Texas. Played at the University of Columbia, ran for over 400 yards in his Columbia career this year. Had a 103-yard game against Marist. And he'll stay out there with Howard, who, again, he can throw, but he is best known for what he does with his legs. That'll be a big test for Japan to face that kind of power rusher as this is caught. And an, a first down as that goes to J.J. Jenkins, another Columbia Lion. And the senior from San Clemente getting involved early. You can see with the elements are doing J.J. Jenkins playing without gloves and there was pressure there was a low hit on Howard and flag thrown around we'll see if this will be for the hit on Nick Howard but a good job by an experienced quarterback to stay in there deliver a strike through contact there's no foul on the parade this okay so they pick up the flag first down here and Take another look at the pass to the honorable mention all Ivy wide receiver J.J. Jenkins. Yeah, it goes down to get this one. It was a nice catch, having a dive for it. Nick Howard, he gives you that option ability as well as a quarterback. He can always tuck and run, and at 6'2", 225, you said that he's a bruiser, tough to bring down. Good run from Edwards here. The Ivy League brought three running backs, Tyson Edwards, Jonathan Ulatu who played at Penn this past season. Former Dartmouth running back Noah Roper. So interesting if we see Howard to Roper and get an all big green combination at some point here today. But that's Edwards once again with Howard in the backfield. Japan with three down linemen. And Howard to the air for the second time. Again, it's Jenkins across midfield and finally ridden out of bounds. Close to the 40 yard line at the 42. And J.J. Jenkins, two catches, two first downs for this Ivy League offense who you thought might be a little bit more run predicated. Yeah, this is all about Hayes Sutton on this play. Zone defense, seam route up the middle. He takes the safeties with him, and J.J. Jenkins just stops underneath. He's right by the boundary where the linebackers can't catch him. Hayes Sutton most recently played at Brown in 2022. Played last season as a graduate student at Duke University. Mentioned there are six players who played at Duke last year playing in this game here for the Ivy League. This time it's Jonathan Mulatu, first carry for the Penn Quaker. And a short gainer there. Mulatu this past season ran for 192 yards, also caught for over 130. Best game of the year was game against Bucknell when he ran for 64 yards and a touchdown. We remember we were there that Penn-Harvard game. Multiple overtimes where Harvard clinched that Ivy title. They could have clinched a, a sole championship but lost the next week at the game at the Yale Bowl. Howard under some pressure and a juggling catch by Mulatu, but he'll go nowhere. Tackle made by the linebacker Hiroki Tokushige. Another one of those players from Fujitsu and a big stop leads to a third down and long. Yeah, plenty of players from Fujitsu playing with their coach, so I'm sure a lot of the playbook today, especially the pressure they're gonna try 
can dial up on defense is very familiar to these Frontiers players. Yeah, that's the interesting thing about the Ivy League. You've got Nick Howard, who is playing for James Perry, who is a really a throwing offense that he runs at Brown. And Howard, more of a running quarterback, so he's getting a chance to use his arm maybe a little bit more in this game than he did for the Big Green. Third and long. Howard under pressure trying to find an outlet. He won't get there. Satoru Takahashi from the Obik Seagulls makes the sack. And the Ivy League marching in the wrong direction. They'll be forced to punt. That's what you need to do for a quarterback that can run, can escape the pocket. Just keep him in there. Good patience. A little bit of a spy here by Takahashi to keep him there. They envelop Howard. Nowhere for him to escape. So Takahashi ends the Ivy League drive that had started fairly promising. Got down to the, about the 41 yard line. And now back to punt, it's Jackson Kennedy. On the long snap from Josh Green. And a big hit. It's like the Ivy League will get called for a penalty here as finally Japan jumps on the football back near the goal line. But you can expect that this is probably going to be a, a Foul against Josh O'Feely, former Brown Bear, for the kick-catch interference. A little bit of testiness here early. Pot's starting to boil over. Good kind of nasty right out of the gates. And I think this kind of shows you that, again, this isn't just about pageantry in this game. There's meaning behind it for both of these teams. And it's a fight. It's going to be intense. O'Feely. Playing uh, for Lamar University this past season. Get another look. A fair catch signal had been made, and obviously Ophelia didn't see it. And then puts a hand in the face of Gimoto as well. And that's kind of where things took off. Kick catch interference. Kick in chief, number four. 15 yard penalty from Smutal Park. And that's a really big help for Japan because they were going to be backed up around their 10-yard line. Now much more starting uh, field position, much more comfortable here for Hiroshi Yamamoto's squad. Yeah, a chance to build and compound some momentum off that opening drive. Really like the balance they showed. Positive plays on first down, and they always had the safety net of Samaji Grant as well. There was a second and 10 where he got nine yards, set it up to third and short. Getting a look at James Perry, the head coach for Brown and the head coach of this Ivy League squad. Last year, it was Al Bagnoli and the Columbia coaching staff who coached the Ivy League in this game. Ended up being the final game that Coach Bagnoli had on the sidelines. We didn't know it at the time, but later that summer announced his retirement. A pitch to Taku Lee, and the captain won't gain much on the toss, Taku Lee, he was an all X league player as a returner. You see what he did as far as rushing numbers in the five game regular season in the X league, but certainly had a lot going into this game. He was a candidate for the NFL's International Player Development Program. He was part of the Montreal Alouettes training camp back in 2021, so he nearly made a CFL team and brought that experience back to his home country. As a run by Yuyu Araki. Backup quarterback getting in. Araki out of the Panasonic Impulse. And he uses that read option. Really kind of debuted it in the X League. We see it a little bit there, that RPO. He sees the opening and he'll take it. He knew exactly where he was going. Yeah, that was a tactic that they hadn't really used. They broke that out in the X League semifinals. It's a great success, but were not able to carry that success into the Rice Bowl where they lost to Fujitsu. Throwing on the run and just a little bit too far over his intended target. He was looking for the wide receiver Yoshio Oshio, who was his teammate on Panasonic Impulse. Yeah, he got walloped as he threw this too, throwing across his body, rolling out to the left. We'll see a lot of that from Iraqi. Throws on the move. Obviously, see what he can do when he tucks it and runs it, but he is someone who is very comfortable escaping the pocket. Koji Noso handles both the place kicking and the punting duties for both Fujitsu and this Japanese squad, and a fair catch called for made back at the 20-yard line. 
That was taken by Hayes Sutton from Brown, and the Ivy League will start its second drive. You see Hayes Sutton gets involved in the passing game. We mentioned he set one up for J.J. Jenkins getting the secondary away, but former Brown player knows this James Perry offense, knows that the James Perry offense means a lot of passing. So Nick Howard will come back out onto the field after the Ivy League drive stalled just inside the Japanese territory. And looks like Howard does have Roper alongside him in the backfield. Fake the give to him, and that pass a little bit too high off the hands of Sutton. And Ivy League very fortunate that ball was not picked off by Japan. For Nick Howard, he's a player who was an honorable mention all Ivy League player this past season, 11 total touchdowns. Again, most of his work being done on the ground. He threw one touchdown and ran for 10. And he'll hand it off to Roper, trying to find space around that right side. Cuts up close to the 25-yard line. Got a helpful block from former Princeton tight end Caden Dumas over on that end of the field. And Sets up for a third and manageable. Big chunk play there, good. And we said to get that Dartmouth to Dartmouth connection again. Needing to get to the 30, third down and five. Howard to the air, and it's incomplete. He was trying to find the tight end, Curtis Raymond from Cornell. Spent the last couple of years playing at TCU. He played in the national championship game a year ago against Georgia. And you see that Horned Frogs hat he has on his back and the Horned Frogs helmet. So we, we do have not just the eight, uh, the seven Ivy League programs that are here. We also have TCU moonlighting. Didn't expect to see that. And with the elements as well, the jersey getting damp looks purple. So the fits work and the former Horned Frog. Kennedy for his second punt. And at the 36-yard line, spinning out of that contact and eventually going down Gimoto. That time he didn't put up the signal for a fair catch and took a legitimate hit. He gets the business from Ophelia again. Two punts in a row, and it's Ophelia and Gimoto getting at it. I mean, we said it was not as testy as the first one, but still some words exchanged between the two. The Ivy League defense did a better job on the last Japanese drive. We'll see what quarterback that Yamamoto elects to go with, whether it's Masamoto or Araki, and it is going back to Yuki Masamoto. And that's a big difference. One's a lefty, one's a righty. Masamoto, the southpaw here, but he'll just use his arm to hand it off to Grant, who scored the touchdown. A 29-yard rumble, this one considerably shorter. Just a couple here for Grant. Yeah, Michael Rutland Jr. was there as well. Cornerback playing tight to the line of scrimmage. There was a couple in the area. That's what you need to do. Get first contact on Grant and make sure you gang tackle. And if you can't stop him yourself, at least buy some time to get a teammate over there. But Japan is playing without some of its better known professional players in this game. Noted it's a different starting quarterback. Last year it was Tsubaba, Tsubagi uh, Tagagi who played. As the handoff again goes to Grant, bounces around, has the first down before he is finally ripped down. Tackle made by Paul Akire, the defensive lineman out of Columbia by way of Virginia, where he played with the Hoos this past season. Just watch Masamoto. All of a sudden he realized this play isn't dead. He has to become a lead blocker and he's downfield for Grant, but that is Grant at his best. Things clogged in front of him, buys himself time, one cut to the outside. He turns what could have been a negative play into another first down, Japan driving again. From the 47, play action fake. Masamoto again on the run, it's caught for a first down. Nab made by Gamoto has been his go-to target here this afternoon. And a play that looked like it was going to be a disaster for the Japanese team ends up with a first down inside the 40. Yeah, Gamoto has really stood out here. Three catches already at two on that opening drive, and this is a nice one. Play breaking down, Matsumoto under pressure. A nice strike as well. 
right on the run. Yuki Masumoto stands 5'10", 198 pounds. Again, 29 years old. The free time out. We have, we have trouble with the chain. So they get the chains in the right spot, and I think that that was the uh, official's timeout. Oh, we, we, we got disconnected <laughs> here. This is a first for everything. Just hope it still measures exactly 10 yards, yeah, exactly. right? Exactly. Good fan turnout. They were uh, promoting free blankets for first number of folks who got in the stadium. It's a little chilly. There was some criticism as to hosting this game at the National Stadium versus the Tokyo Dome, which is, of course, indoors because, you know, it, you think about Japan in the summertime in Tokyo, it gets stiflingly hot. Well, it's a fairly chilly day. It's been mid-40s. As you can tell, it's been wet. So you really salute the, the folks and their love of American football for coming out and supporting this experience. You can see umbrellas. It's uh, It's been a little bit of a drizzly day. It's washed away some of the paint from the field. And, and now how many members of the Ivy League coaching staff does it take to help get the chains put back together? Well, smart people, so hopefully it should be done quickly. But again, never seen this. And But credit to the fans that did come out today. You can tell the rain is still coming down pretty steadily. J.J. Jenkins playing without gloves, one of the wide receivers for the Ivy League. So the elements are going to have a big impact in this game. We've seen some passing out of the gates, but as we go further and further into the game, Things get more damp, the field gets a little bit more dug up when we turn to the ground game. And if you're James Perry or his defensive coordinator, Tim Weaver, you're saying to your team, hey, they won't be stretching these chains as often if we just stop giving up some first downs here. We need to make a stop. Yeah, exactly. Big plays they're giving up. And talking about nine, ten yards per play. And Japan, we saw in that first drive, they like the up-tempo offense. They don't want to let you get settled. And, Japan, especially in that first drive, you script your first few offensive plays. They knew what they were doing, and those third and shorts, they went quick. Japan returns three starters from last year's Dream Japan Bowl. We mentioned some of the stars that are not here. Subasa Takagi, the starting quarterback from last year. The current MVP of the X League, Treshawn Nixon, who played in last year's game, not playing in this year's game. Also some other interior defensive linemen. Uh, various reasons, injury, the grueling season that they just got over playing, uh, just schedules not working out. So there was a little bit of concern from Japan's side that, hey, we don't have our A team here for this matchup. And the thought was, it looks like the Ivy League is bringing a stronger team this year than they brought last year. So those two elements uh, put Japan kind of on notice that it was going to take really good execution today to knock off this team from the U.S. Yeah, for the Ivy League as well. You we mentioned all those guys that played for Power 5 schools last year. So not just guys who played in the Ivy League this year, guys who played three, four years in the H&A and, and then went on, played some pretty big-time football. So you just go up and down this roster. There are some standouts for the Team Ivy. All right, I think somebody got the duct tape and some pliers and that chain working to perfection right now. It is a first down at the 35-yard line of the Ivy League for Japan and movement. After all that waiting, I think they iced their offensive line. Let's see if this backs up the Japanese team five yards. Four start. Four hands, 71. Five-yard penalty. Still faster. It's on the left tackle, Guo Yuning, who was an all-X League player, once again, for Fujitsu. He's a China native. He's one of those foreign players who is on this squad. That chain stoppage almost feels like a timeout in basketball. The other team's going on a run. Japan had back-to-back -back big plays, first downs. Now, all of a sudden, when they were starting to get into a groove, slow things down a couple of minutes, and the false start shows just out of sync in the resumption. Big run here for Nanto Nishimura, and he will get that penalty yardage back and then some going down close to the 32-yard line. So a pickup of close to seven on the ground for Nishimura. And 
And a good start here after the false start. Two wide receivers again. It's Nishimura, and he will get inside the 30-yard line. Needs to get to about the 24 for another Japan first down. Cole Aubrey had him right there, and you just see the way that Aubrey had to tackle him, tackle him upfield as Nishimura went with a little bit of pace through the A-gap. 5'8", 187 pounds. The running backs for Japan are not as big as you might expect, you know, your traditional running back to be the heaviest is Taku Lee at 194 pounds. Looking for Grant, and now pressure coming. Down goes Masamoto. And combining on the sack, it's Terrence Lane and Cole Aubrey. And this drive may be thwarted. It'd be a long field goal in tough conditions for Japan if they elect to do so. Yeah, play that the Ivy League needed. 30-yard line, third down, able to get in the backfield. And they're going for this one in rough conditions, about 49, 50 yards. Yeah, it looks like it's set up on the other side of the 40, so 51-yard field goal for Koji Noso to make it a 10-0 game. And it's good, just crept over the crossbar. And a 51-yard kick for Noso has given Japan a 10-0 lead as we come to the end of the first quarter. Can't script it any better through the first quarter of this one. Japan, they score on the opening drive when they get the ball first, march down the field consistently, and complimentary football they're playing. The defense has really stepped up. They've limited the Ivy League so far. Nick Howard hasn't been able to get much going offensively, and great boot to put an end to a great first quarter. Where's that Fujitsu Frontiers helmet? Again, one of 24 players from that club. You know, uh, similar to Japanese baseball, a lot of these teams have not necessarily sponsorships from big companies. We, we heard Panasonic, Fujitsu, a bunch of other companies as well. Uh, oftentimes, the players are employees of the company and that is part of their duties. They, it, when they're not playing football, they're working for the company in some capacity. Not every team in the league is like that, but that's typically how it was in the past. And so it's a very different professional structure than what we have back in the United States when it comes to professional football. So the Ivy League has got to find a way to wake up here in this game, Tyler. 10 nothing and they haven't been able to crack inside the 40-yard line on either of their drives. Yeah, it's a big drive to start this second quarter. Just trying to get something going. Too many negative plays so far for the Ivy League. There's been pressure. We mentioned in that game last year, really stood out was the battle of the trenches. The Ivy League dominated. You see the cheerleaders here at the National Stadium, but the Ivy League dominated the line of scrimmage last year. Clean pockets every time offensively and defensively putting pressure on the quarterbacks. A lot of contact hasn't been that way so far. Japan, a lot of it's been Samaji Grant as well when the Ivy League has been able to win that first step. He's just so patient, waits for things to develop, and he has had some big plays in the first quarter. So no so, surely high after knocking that one through the uprights. Gets ready for the kickoff here, and the Ivy League will try and respond as move on to the Start of the quarter. So this is the first play of the second quarter. See if there's a run back. This will not be run back and nearly goes out of bounds in the field of play. So it is a touchback, but very close to going out near that pylon. He was just able to sneak it. And his first kick of the game almost drilled it out of the back of the end zone. It was returned by the Ivy League, that was inches away. Is See the Syracuse helmet right there for Sugano. Yeah, that's Yusuke Sugano, who played the last two seasons at Syracuse. Really interesting story. He wanted to play football in the United States. He's from uh, Akashi, Japan. He applied to go to a high school in the United States, ended up going to high school in Pennsylvania, and started off his college career at St. Francis before transferring to play his last two years of eligibility at Syracuse. As the Ivy League hands it off to Noah Roper who gets across the 30. So really interesting, you know, his 
dream after football is to contribute to Japanese football as a coach or potentially as a player, obviously, and this is all part of it. So really interesting to see the college helmet of an ACC program here playing in the Dream Japan Bowl. Yeah, we saw TCU earlier, but now on the other side for Syracuse, he sees what it's like. He has the stickers as well, the U.S. and Japanese sticker. He wants the development in his home country. By the way, in a quarterback here for the Ivy League as Roper got that handoff is Joe Green. Green played the last three years at Columbia. This past season was one of a few different quarterbacks that Columbia used. He didn't throw his first pass this season until uh, mid-October, recovering from an injury. He tore his uh, labrum in his right shoulder during his second season in New York City. But Green, the other quarterback, in addition to Howard, he's more of your typical pocket passer than Nick Howard is. On a third and two, he gives it to his Columbia teammate Edwards, and he'll get just shy of where he needs to get to. And we've got flags coming out. And how about the reaction there from Ben Hoytink? Ben Hoytink, uh, I think, earning that call and then the celebration on the penalty. I love it. There's been some jarring after these plays. J.J. Jenkins was getting into it. Oh yeah, this game has had some temperature to it. It started on a couple of special teams plays, some scuffles, and that celebration, the exuberance of getting this automatic first down, what it looks like it'll be. Yeah, to finish on Sugano, you know, he, he played American football as a student in Japan at AT&T Stadium, and that's really what kind of lit the light bulb in his head and really drove him to come over to the United States. When he came over to high school, he barely spoke any English. Found a way to excel Out there. The Personal foul. Unnecessary roughness. Defense number 42. 15 yard penalty. Autowatch faster. So the penalty goes on Yohei Komiya, who plays for the Nojima Saga Mihara Rise. He's one of two players from that team. The other is Junpei Gimoto, who we've seen contribute as a wide receiver for Team Japan. And it's just one thing when you hold the Ivy League short on that third and short, getting off the field, it's been a great start for the defense, and you just gift an automatic first down. You want to be physical, obviously. You want to set a tone, but do within the rules. Yeah, that's a damaging penalty. Gives the Ivy League a first down near midfield. Edwards breaking tackles, and he gets nudged out of bounds inside the 35-yard line. A run of more than 15 yards for Tyson Edwards, and the Ivy League is in business. You see after the play as well, once it gets brought down, you're too little. But you just follow your blockers off left tackle, and it takes a couple of different players to bring him down, just kept trudging forward, kept the feet moving, and really one of the first big plays we've seen. See if that sparks the Ivy League offense. This is the deepest into Japanese territory that they have been in this game, down at the 34-yard line. Green to throw, complete, no, incomplete. It was intended for the tight end Zion Carter, who played this past season at Buffalo, but you see the Dartmouth helmet on his cap. It was at Dartmouth from 2019 to 2022. And the son of former NFL star Kevin Carter, who was the number six overall draft pick by the then St. Louis Rams back in the 90s. Well, Joe Green knew he needed to fit that in. That was a bullet that he threw, and on a very wet day, just tough to bring that fastball down. But so far in this game, the bright spots offensively have been Columbia players for the Ivy. Tyson Edwards a big run. Joe Green has got things moving. J.J. Jenkins a couple of completions. Green flushed out, retreating, and will just throw this away. So a third and ten. Receiver in the area, Hayes Sutton. But good pressure by Japan as that forced Green to bail on that. Here at the National Stadium, what a venue for the Ivy League to take on Japan in the Dream Japan Bowl for the second consecutive year. And right now the Ivy League failing, facing a deficit that they did not face last year. They had uh, short margins that they trailed by in that game before ultimately winning by four. On third and 10, it's Howard. He'll keep it himself. Howard rumbling forward to the 25. 
needed to get just inside the 25, and it's fourth down. Yeah, just bringing him out there to show is there you see the career ranks for Nick Howard. It's the rush yards. That's why they just brought him out there. Third and 10, maybe just outside the cusp of field goal range. Downhill runner, try and get some yards, and maybe if you get close enough, keep the offense out there. And it looks like that's what James Perry's going to do. Now Jackson Kennedy, you see the kicker was looking. Am I coming on? No, it looks like the Ivy League will go forward. Fourth and a short two. That's Mulatu in the backfield with Howard. And the keeper, but Whistles, will blow this one dead. Jimmy timeout. Team Ivy League. This is a first so, timeout. First timeout taken by James Perry. We'll see if they elect to go for it again on fourth and short or if they do decide to bring out Jackson Kennedy, who is a terrific field goal kicker up at Ithaca. He made all Ivy as both a kicker and a punter, second team all Ivy this past season, so they've got a pretty reliable guy. Interestingly, though, uh, unlike the Japanese team, they have the duties split here between Ben Krim, who is the official designated punter, and Kennedy, who's the kickoff and place kicker. Yeah, good time out here taken by James Perry. First drive, then really you start to get some momentum. Just talk it over, fourth and two, aggressive call. You're in field goal range for Kennedy, but I think you've just seen a little bit of aggression as well for the Ivy League getting down early in this game, trying to provide a counter punch. I see Suganu, graduate transfer to Syracuse after his time at St. Francis. He won a high school national championship. Uh, it's uh, Kwansei Gakuin High School, and now it's fourth and two, and James Perry will go for it. This time it's a give. Mulatu has the first down, and will he go down? He does inside the 10. Got more than enough on fourth and two. Explodes down to the eight-yard line. You just see setting the edge. And it's the right guard, Hoytnick, that gets up there, gets a linebacker out of the play and opens things wide open for Mulatu. Needed two and turns into a big play. First and goal, Mulatu stays out there with Howard. Best drive of the day for the Ivy League. Mulatu again, right side, and he won't go anywhere. He's held up. Looked like Jabbery Williams, the defensive end, was in on the stop. Williams played his college football at Wake Forest. He's a Fort Lauderdale native. In the X League, he plays for the Panasonic Impulse. Had five tackles in the Rice Bowl. And a former X League MVP, his first full season over in Japan 2021. He was the MVP as a defensive end. Yeah, Japan just said right there, we will not get fooled again. Pretty similar play call, and they snuff it out. It's Mulatu once again, and he's hammered. Knocked back. This time the tackle made by the linebacker, Satoru Takahashi. He had the sack earlier on the Ivy League's first drive. They get that one run play from Mulatu, the big chunk, and starting to fall in love with it. A couple back-to-back, -back, but Japan has done well. Obviously, things condensing in the red zone. Try and get out to the edge here. Try and use some speed on this third and goal. Ivy League has only picked up a couple of yards since getting this goal to go opportunity. Third down. And that's Roper in the backfield with Howard. I'm watching left side one-on-one -on -one coverage if they want it. That's Nick LeBoy at the top of the screen. Howard flushed. Eyes to the end zone. Floats one. And it is incomplete. Out of bounds. Tried to get it to Harvard tight end Tim Dowd. Made the grab, but he was, it might be a little tough to tell, but he was out of bounds. Yeah, by a few yards here. Nick Howard gave a quick look to the left. It was a quick slant, and then this play, he's forced to his right. Feels the pressure coming. Maybe even a little bit of a hold there that allows Howard to get out, but offed it up there, but a few yards out of bounds. And so Kennedy will come on for the short field goal attempt. 22-yarder 
and it's good. So the Ivy League has its best drive of the day, ends in three points. Their first points here in Tokyo, and the margin is a touchdown. A yeah, nice stand by the Japanese defense. They get beat on that one run play from Milatu, and then the Ivy League goes right back to it. Twice they tried to run that off right tackle, and twice Japan was able to hold it to a small loss. Good stand on third down with the pressure that was applied. Last year when these teams met, it was the first international match held in Tokyo in 14 years. And that was a game where the Ivy League led for most of the way, not the entire game, but really it was the end of the game when the Ivy League went on a 14-play drive. They milked seven and a half minutes off the fourth quarter clock. The Japanese team got it back with eight seconds left in the game and had one desperation play that was unable to come to fruition. And the Ivy League escaped, but it's going to have to be a come-from-behind victory if they hope to repeat that feat this year. A good sign shown on that drive, and it started with Joe Green in the pocket. A couple of passing plays that got this offense moving, and then Columbia Lions have really stood out offensively so far in this game. The run back coming for Lee, and he will not make it out to the 20-yard line. So the Japanese team will take over from there. Now a lead been cut to 10-3. to They've gone back and forth between Araki and Masamoto. And it looks like they will go back to Yuya Araki. Five feet, 10 inches tall, 181 pounds. From the Panasonic Impulse, the give to Lee. And not a whole lot there. Picks up maybe two or three yards. Bottom of that pile for the Brown Bears was Tommy Maloney. Newton, Massachusetts native. Played in all 10 games for the Bears this past season. It's an Ivy League team that, you know, for a lot of them, you know, we, we heard it at the top of our broadcast. You know, competed against each other for four years and now finally get to be teammates as this is complete to Boogie Knight. And he gets tackled. Ball pops out, but down was the whistle there. Like that was Cooper DeVoe in on the tackle. Boogie Knight played at Louisiana Monroe, Akron, and Ohio State in his NCAA career. Then came over to Japan and was the rookie of the year in the X League this past season. And also a member of the all-name team. The given name is Jeremiah, but Boogie just sounds a lot better. Here's an incompletion over to the left side. That was intended for the running back, Lee. And Araki moving to his left could not complete, and this will bring out the punting unit. A oh, good stop here for the Ivy League. Get some points, trying to chip back away, and they're going to have some good field position as well with this stop right around the 20. No so. Heels just shy of the 10 yard line, set to punt. Ivy League does not bring pressure here as that ball had to be picked up off the turf and Noso does get it away and will take a Japan roll close to the 31 yard line. That could have been disaster for Team Japan. It works out all right. Now the Ivy League will take over after scoring a field goal on its last drive. Just a good job by Noso to make anything out of this. You said this could be problematic, disastrous for Japan. This would have set the Ivy League right up in the red zone. But good job to feel that you don't know what, how slick things are, what that bounce will be like coming off of the grass. But he does a good job, quick thinking under some duress as well. Okay, earlier this week, Team Japan practiced in some thunder snow. It was uh, an evening practice and. They had to, to wait a while for the lightning to go away, and then snow came pouring down. This is Roper, and he'll make his way to the 35-yard line, a pickup of close to three. And you know, both of these teams, we talked about at the top of the broadcast, Tyler, the chemistry of, okay, how are we going to play together when we've never played together outside of the, a handful of practices? And certainly difficult for the Ivy League 
making the long trip as well, getting acclimated to the vastly different time zone as Roper fighting off tacklers across the 40. He'll be really close to a first down. Yeah, it's not really going to be too many exotic looks offensively. It's more vanilla play calling wise because it has to be with all these new faces. But one thing that doesn't change is winning one on one battles. You can win one on ones, which Roper just did right there. He's able to go through contact, get a few extra yards. It's Yohei Komiya who lost his helmet and had to come off. A couple of good runs by Roper. He played this past season in Division II at the Colorado School of Mines. Great nickname for them, the Ore Diggers. Play action goes to him, and now an a completion to the right side. And this will be a first down. Goes to the tight end, Raymond. He's to the 43-yard line. Well, you can just feel this offense. You see the TCU helmet again, just starting to get in motion here. Nice roll out to the right by the tight end. And again, they just flush the receivers out, get them downfield, and that second level is wide open for Raymond to get some chunk yards. Raymond last played for Cornell in 2021 when he caught 27 passes for 534 yards and four touchdowns. Played in 12 games for TCU this past season, mostly on special teams. So it's got to be great for him to play offense again in a game. It's green in a quarterback. Floats one, left side. This is caught by Edwards, and he'll drive his way forward for another Ivy League first down to the 31-yard line, and now the Ivy Leaguers are starting to pick things up and get some rhythm offensively. It's this Columbia connection again. Nice little floater here on the screen pass, getting by the initial pressure, and then it's just a three-on-three -three upfield. Put a hat on a hat, open things up for Edwards. Room to run into for the former Lion. Joe Green went on a little bit of a journey before he got to Columbia. He initially committed to going to Harvard before signing with San Diego State and then eventually coming back to the Ivy League and Columbia. Here's his teammate Edwards, picks up a chunk of six or seven on the first down run. It just feels like one of those doesn't belong. Harvard, Columbia, and then all the way coast to coast, San Diego State. Earned a medical redshirt year at San Diego State before transferring into the Ivy League. You don't see a lot of transfers into the Ivy League. And the players that we've said that play for other schools, they've generally graduated from their Ivy League programs and still maintain some eligibility outside the Ivy League, which is why you see so many players going on to finish out their eligibility somewhere else. Green on the move, throws incomplete. He was looking for Hayes Sutton, another one of those players who's gone elsewhere to Duke now. But we showed you the numbers earlier. The 24 players on the Ivy League team played at other programs this past season, 16 at Power 5 programs. A lot of folks don't realize the high level of talent for some of these individuals in the Ivy League, that they can compete and start for teams that play in the ACC, SEC, Big 12. Which is really such a good opportunity. Four years as an Ivy League player, great education. You maintain eligibility, play some Big time college football, really prime yourself. For Here's the NFL. Mulatu around the left side, and he gets nicked out of bounds. Finally stopped by Ryota Okuda, and it's another goal to go situation for the Ivy League on the long run by Jonathan Mulatu. But hold everything, we might have a flag. Let's see if this is coming back. And the Ivy League marching back in the direction that says, yep, this one might be on us. Yeah, it looks like it's in the area of holding, and that would eliminate what was a very big run again by Milatu. Another big conversion. Holding. Oh, hey. 74. 10 yard penalty. Repeat, Sada. It's called on John Paul Flores, who played at Dartmouth before finishing up his career this past season, playing in 12 games at the University of Louisville. And that negates the fine run by Mulatu. And so, that's the Ivy League in a much tougher position here. Backed up the extra 10 yards. Third and 16, all the way back at the 38 yard line. Yeah, big two takes you out of field goal range as well. Just got to be smart here. 
on this third down. Just try and get a couple yards, get back in range for Kennedy. Green in a quarterback. It's a pass, facing a blitz, throws, incomplete. He was looking for Sutton. And the Japanese defense holds. And from the 38-yard line, options are fairly limited as to what you can do if you're the Ivy League. Yeah, it's almost one of those plays where you just go inside handoff, hope that Japan's playing back and prevent defense and try and get five, six yards out of it. But yeah, it takes you out of range, and holding call is a killer. So the Ivy League will be forced to punt here with Ben Krim. Krim spent this past season at Notre Dame as a punter there. He punted for Penn and was a two-time first-team All-Ivy punter. This will take a bounce back toward the 10-yard line, and Japan will take over at the 8. And once again, in the middle of it, it's Josh Ophelia as he has been on all of these punts, seemingly. Yeah, he's made his impact felt. He's been in and around the action on special teams. Him and Gamoto have really enjoyed each other in this game so far, the punt returner. But just looking at things for the Ivy, five and a half minutes left in this half. If you can get a stop here, Good field position on offense with two timeouts, and then you get the ball back at halftime. Maybe a chance for a big swing in this game. Masamoto back in at quarterback for Japan. And the give to Samaji Grant bounces off a tackler. He's got a first down and then finally decides to go out of bounds at the 30. A 22-yard run by Samaji Grant who had the 29-yard touchdown run for the only touchdown this afternoon. And some jarring after the play with Chris Rankins. It was helmet to helmet there, but this is Grant once again at his best. Through contact, second effort, bouncing outside, and then you just see there were six defenders trying to catch up to him. Rankins, the former Penn Quaker, he played at Northern Arizona this past year. And this will be a pickup of two or three in the tackle made by once again, Princeton's Cole Aubrey. And he, like the punter Krim, they were teammates, they were competitors in the Ivy League, and now teammates at Notre Dame this past season. Aubrey was valedictorian of his high school class at St. John Bosco, and then had a very good career at Princeton. <laughs> Second and nine. And Masamoto in trouble, spins at a pressure, throws it away and incomplete. Had Matsui. But pretty impressive job of avoiding the, the sack there by Masamoto. Yeah, this could have gone for negative 10 if Masamoto isn't quick thinking here. And we saw him already make a play with his legs where he was flushed out of the pocket back in that first quarter, delivered a strike running to his left. So. He did have Matsui. Third and nine. Needing to get out to the 43-yard line. After they were backed up to their eight. Empty backfield for Masamoto. Here comes the pressure. Flushed out. Aubrey gets to him, and it's incomplete. Cole Aubrey having himself a game. What a sequence for the graduate student from California. And that'll force a Jap Japanese punt. Well, this was nice disguised pressure by the Ivy League. They put five linebackers that looked back right at the line to gain. And it looked like it was just four down linemen and all of a sudden an exotic look and breakdown. So intentional grounding is the call there. No receiver in the area for Masamoto. He was in the grasp there of Cole Aubrey, so that'll just make the punts come from that much deeper here. Japan still holding on to the 10-3 lead. Just over four minutes to go before we hit halftime. Just like college football, have a, a good long halftime for football in Japan. 
as Noso gets this away. And this will get a few extra yards and go inside the 40-yard line. The Ivy League will take over close to its own 38, trailing 10-3 here at the National Stadium in Tokyo. An estimated 5,000 high school students in Japan play American football. And there's roughly 10,000 who participate at the university level. So it's pretty impressive the way that football has grown. It was introduced to the country back in 1934 and has steadily grown. Howard keeps it and he gets rumbled down close to the 46 yard line. And Nick Howard showing off, he is never afraid to dish out some punishment. You know, when we were getting ready for the Dartmouth Harvard game earlier this season, you know, we had coaches saying, he, you could tell he's got a little bit of Brett Favre in him. He's a Green Bay guy, likes to throw his body around and get physical the way that Brett Favre would. A different type of game, you know, to some degree in terms of Howard, but he is not afraid to use his legs. He just has a little bit of Josh Allen in him. When he gets out of the pocket and runs, he embraces the contact. He's looking for it. He doesn't shy away. Escapes a man, and he'll move forward close to the marker. Oh, Need to get to that 48-yard line. Clock continuing to roll here. Ivy League has two timeouts remaining. See if it's enough for the first down. It'll either be first and 10 or third and inches. They got the stop they needed on defense. Now an opportunity to get some points on the board before halftime. You control it here with the two timeouts, clock winding under three, and you get the ball to start the second half. So an opportunity, you can erase that 10-0 deficit, get it yourself a little bit of a cushion with a lead. And so it's third and less than one. Howard keeps it and can't get away. Tackle by Toshigi, uh, Tokushige. Hiroki Tokushige, part of that linebacker duo with Takahashi, and both have come up with big stops on the quarterback. They go with that zone read, little option play, and Tokushige would not be fooled. He's the only man there in the area, and he takes care of it. And a huge stop on third down as the Ivy was starting to get moving here, and Tokushige just a great job. Didn't overcommit on that option. He watched the entire thing develop and then had a chance to get Nick Howard in the open field. A little surprising Japan didn't take a time out there. Could have saved a little bit of time here as the punt from Krim fielded inside the 10-yard line. And this is Grant. Dances his way forward to pick up a few extra. And so clock running down toward a minute and a half to go. And Japan will see if they have time and ability to add on to this seven point lead. You know, Philly was shot out of a cannon again. He just missed what would have been a humongous tackle. He was in the area, but there's plenty of time. Three timeouts. You see, good look there at Samaji Grant. Expect him to get it plenty here in this drive. And you just see the elements. This rain has really not relented whatsoever. The middle of the field, the battle of the trenches, it's just getting muckier and muckier. From the 20 yard line, Masamoto incomplete. Ivy League hopping up and down on the sideline. A couple of Ivy players landed on either side of where that football was. Again, difficult day to catch the football with the rain. It's been persistent. It's Genta Shibata from Fujitsu. Second and 10. And now much safer design as Grant will stumble forward to pick up a couple of yards. Terrence Lane, honorable mention all Ivy this past season with the Brown Bears, makes the stop. Michigan native, had three and a half sacks. A guy who opposing coaches around the Ivy League said, yeah, he's just disruptive and a guy with so much talent. And it looks like they're just going to let this wind down a little. There was an opportunity after that incompletion where if the Ivy League calls a timeout after a good stop there, get a stop on third down. You can get the ball back with around a minute left, no timeouts, but decent field position. 
Yeah, the shoe on the other foot here. Ivy League and James Perry not calling a timeout. Grants the handoff close to the 25, but he'll be about five yards shy. And now let's see if the Ivy League does elect to call a timeout. It appears they do and will force Japan to punt here and give themselves an opportunity and should get decent field position. And a good opportunity, good timing. Could be a little bit more liberal with some play calling here late, try and get some big stretch plays, use both sidelines and get the receivers back in the mix. We saw a lot of J.J. Jenkins early and haven't seen much since, still trying to get some targets for Hayes Sutton as well. By the way, if you're wondering, is the X League a possibility for you know, former NFL players? The answer is no. If you have professional experience playing in the NFL, not necessarily a training camp, but if you have experience playing in regular season games, then you're not allowed to participate. And I think that the league, obviously, its primary focus, while they do allow foreign players, it's to grow the game among Japanese-born population. Yeah, they don't want to get watered down with fringe NFL talent. They're trying to develop the product, like you said, in home, and they've done a great job doing it. Just the lengths, the consistency of this league, and started this game on a 10-0 run, trying to beat a U.S. team and show the, just the strides that Japan is taking solely. Good kick here from Noso, and Ivy League's just going to let this roll down close to the 10-yard line. <laughs> How about the efforts there by Yuya Watanabe? Trying to use as much wind as possible to blow that closer to the goal line, but with so much field in front, it wouldn't be a surprise to see the Ivy League just take a knee and go to halftime. Yeah, just thinking the same thing. That is a huge boot from Koji Noso, and you're thinking maybe something a little bit shorter, you get the ball around the 30-40, it's in attack mode with the one timeout, 29 seconds. Don't think that'll be the case anymore. That completely flips field. Well, if Japan wants to, they can use their timeouts and force a punt, and maybe that's why the Ivy League does not come out right away with a knee. Instead, it's Roper driving ahead for pickup of close to six yards. Japan does not elect to use the timeout. Let's see if that's the final play of the first half. I'd imagine it will be if Japan elects not to use its three. So Japan comes out of the gates and gets a touchdown on its very first drive, builds up a 10-0 lead. The Ivy League got inside the 10, kicked a field goal, and here's where we stand. A seven-point game at halftime here from the National Stadium in Tokyo. And it's been a competitive first 30 minutes. See if the Ivy League has a comeback ahead of itself. As we get ready for the second half, you're watching the Japan National Football Association's Dream Japan Bowl on ESPN. and quarks of nano engineering wordsworth or hip-hop then look no further than brown university if you want to work side by side with extraordinary faculty to choose from 78 academic majors across the spectrum or to follow a major of your own design then expect some of the brightest young minds from around the world to surround and engage you at brown university take it from me i'm john krasinski class of 2001 Pulitzer Prize-winning author Herman Woke once wrote, the best things of the moment were outside the rectangle of Columbia. 
The best things of all human history and thought were inside. If only you had the sense, you could spend four years in an unforgettably exciting alternation between two realms of magic. That doubled magic is lasting me a lifetime. It's the greatest combination of athletics and academics you can get in a university, and it's really humbling being surrounded by so many like-minded people. It's an institution with a lot of history. Now I'm in this place where I know how to balance my life, and it's great. Here, there is such a focus on academics and athletics, and so you get to play at a really high level, but you also get to be in the classroom at a really high level. It's been special to throw on this, uh, this color every day. It's been something I'm very grateful for. When you become a part of a sport at Dartmouth, you're becoming part of something a whole lot bigger than you ever could have imagined. The bond between two Dartmouth people is really special because even if it's separated by 10 or 20 years, they know that they have a common experience. It's neat to really just get together and to learn through each other. This is where I'm from and this is, this is me. Like Dartmouth is who I am. I think the shared commitment we all have is that we're here to decrease the stigma around mental health. We want to make it a more open conversation, whether it's talking about student athlete mental health, coaches mental health. We got one goal, we just gotta work together to complete that. I think the, the evolution of the conversation about mental health has become prominent year after year for the last decade, if not more. But I think we're finally at the tipping point where the conversation isn't just about how are we reactive to prevent worst case scenarios, but how are we managing everyday stressors and activities? I have really loved today. I mean, just the conversations. I love talking about mental health, and so being able to dive deeper. I think the keynote was incredible, seeing what mental health and athletics looks like really at the highest level. Mental health is the same thing as physical health, right? We all have it. You guys are all in the sports space. You wake up in the morning and you do a physical check. It might actually inform how you work out that day, how you approach your training. What would happen if we took the same approach to mental health? This is my first mental health summit that I've been able to attend, and just recognizing the value of sharing those best practices. We all have very unique institutions, and so, you know, I think it's very valuable to sit here and think, hey, that's really cool, you know, jot that down. How can I adapt that for our institution? And it's also a really incredible moment to be able to just have a lot of school pride, a lot of league pride. I've always thought mental health is very important. The stress and anxiety that student athletes have to go through to play their sport, to compete in their sport, like there's so much going on outside of that. And I think this Mental Health Summit is like a really good step forward to decrease that stigma and to continue to give access and to continue to give thoughts. I think mental health is something where, because we don't talk about it as often, I think coaches might not fully understand the grasp of what that feels like to an athlete. If your team is not open about talking about mental health, you have to open the doors and you have to be like, guys, like, we're all in this together. Dartmouth College has taken holistic student athlete development incredibly seriously. I was one of a few athletic administrators with a sports psychology background. And then since my role has evolved in the last five years, I've been able to continue to support a team, a team that is collectively building to enhance mental wellness, well-being, and performance of all of our student athletes. How do we make sure we're cultivating an environment? And this is where everyone in the room has an impact on the environment that occurs within your campus and all of us need to be actively cultivating it. I want the idea of mental health being stigmatized to be something so of the past that we can't even imagine not having this open conversation. Walk a mile in our shoes, from the classroom to the locker room. Here, our promise and our passion propel us down paths few dare to travel. We venture forward, energized with every step. We defy convention in defining ourselves, pushing to achieve, serve, and lead at the highest level with teammates, teachers, coaches, and classmates at our side. Together, we are Tigers. Together, 
We are Princeton. How you doing? This is James Perry. I just wanted to extend a huge congratulations to Coach Murphy, uh, an immensely terrific career that he had. Uh, we all, I know I speak for the entire Brown football community when I say that we have tremendous respect for him and what he did. So congrats, Coach Murph. And I also wanted to say uh, the amount of lives that he touched was remarkable. And I'm getting a chance here over in Japan to coach some examples, uh, some fine examples of Harvard football players whose lives were affected in a positive way. So congrats to Coach Murphy. Coach Murphy, we just want to congratulate you on an amazing career. You know, you're not just the leader of the program. You have been the program for the past 30 years. We want to congratulate you on the best career as an Ivy League head coach anyone's ever seen. So, arigato, arigato. Gazuma. Part of the Harvard contingent and of course, James Perry bidding adieu and a congratulations to Harvard football coach Tim Murphy retiring after 30 years in Cambridge as we rejoin you from the National Stadium in Tokyo getting start for the second half it's 10-3 the Japanese squad leading the Ivy League alongside Tyler Davey I'm Alex Vespoli glad he could join us the lone touchdown was a 29 yard run by Samaji Grant on Japan's first drive of the game and so far, that's the difference between the two teams. Yeah, one thing that's really stood out in this game is just Ben Japan's ability to run the ball early and downs. First and 10, get a big play, stay on schedule offensively. But how about their defense as well? Getting pressure, keeping this Ivy League team out of sync so far. One thing to watch in the second half as it continues to rain, ball security. Weren't many turnovers, Benny, in that first half. Who's going to have the big breakthrough defensive play that can set your team up flip the field, put you in a spot to score. Yeah, the field, as you can see, is taking a beating from the rain and, of course, this game. But we haven't seen as much in terms of uh, guys slipping, but we have seen a few passes bounce off players' hands, and you know, so the conditions might lead themselves to be uh, more suitable to potential fumbles or other turnovers. Definitely something to keep in mind is Ivy League quarterback Nick Howard in there, the former Dartmouth Big Green. And he'll give it to his former teammate Noah Roper in an explosive run here on the first play out of halftime from scrimmage. Noah Roper spent this past season at the Colorado School of Mines where he was a first team all conference player, second team all Colorado. He is an Erie, Colorado native and had a very good career with the big green, a guy with some lateral quickness but really known for his power game. The umpire was in there on the last tackle as well. He was in the pig pile, and good positive start for the Ivy League. One thing I want to see in this second half, be a little bit more two-dimensional offensively. When they've had the big plays, they followed it up trying to go back to the same thing. Remember Jonathan Mulatu on the fourth down conversion, then they gave it to him twice more. Spread things around, get the ball in space, try and use your speed. Respotting the football to... Make sure that it's a first down here after the run went for 11 yards by Roper. Harvard center, Trevor Radicevich out of the University of Pennsylvania and Cincinnati. Snaps it back to Howard. Short pass left. It's J.J. Jenkins who had a big role early in that first quarter. And Jenkins will make his way out of bounds, but not before picking up another Ivy first down. Now yeah, we mentioned it earlier with Jenkins just showing what the conditions are doing, playing without gloves. Here today, he had two catches 
on that opening drive. Want to see him get more involved as well. Tremendous size, 6'2", 200. Get him one-on-one -on -one and make plays on the outside. Guy who always had a, a ton of ability, finally matured his last couple of years into putting it all together as Howard will take it across midfield and go down to the 48-yard line. Nick Howard, he was described by Sammy McCorkle as a true Dartmouth man, a guy who really embodied everything that the Big Green want to see from their student athletes and has so much pride, wanted to make sure that he came back and finished things the right way this past year, and hey, it worked out to the tune of an Ivy League championship. On second and six, Howard to throw. Now he's not going to find any space, and he'll lose some yardage. Tackle was made in on that hit. It was Jabbery Williams. Let's take another look. Also getting involved on the hit was Masao Uda of the Fujitsu Frontiers. They know Howard's ability to run the ball, so keeping one of those linebackers as a spy just helps when the line of scrimmage breaks down. But a good job once again. We saw it in the first half. This Japanese team does a good job keeping Howard in the pocket and then enveloping him with numbers. Can't miss Jabari Williams with that hair that goes down to his waist, setting up on the right side of the defensive line, and a false start coming against Tim Dowd. Got a little jittery over there on that right side. This will make a third down a bit longer here for the Ivy League. You know, Jabari Williams, he played in the Belk Bowl against Texas A&M, had a great game, an interception and a fumble recovery with 11 tackles. He went to the Philadelphia Eagles training camp in 2018, but was cut, then played in the Alliance of American Football. Remember that? And then the XFL, before those leagues were disbanded, the most recent versions of them, he was ready to give up football before a coach at Wake Forest put him in touch with the Japanese League and he was able to continue his career. This drive won't continue as Jonathan Mulatsu only gets back to the 48-yard line as Japan sniffs that out. And the Ivy League once again gets to midfield and will have to punt. Haven't been many penalties in the Ivy League in this game, but they have just been demoralizing when they've been taken. Remember that holding call that brought back a big run from Jonathan Mulatsu in the first half? Now this fall start is the Ivy League was starting to drive a little bit, third and eight around midfield maybe thinking about four down territory you push it a little more but you just put yourself out of that situation another punt upcoming so it's fourth and less than five this is one of those in between areas and Krim will punt it away fair catch no not made everyone thought it was a fair catch but the catch was made by Gimoto and well it's playing with fire a little bit there because they had two returners back as well and usually in that situation those two returners are screaming at everyone vacate the premises you don't want this to go off you but Gamoto having to run back reset himself to make that catch you saw Gamoto almost looked like he was calling for a flag saying I did fair catch that ball but then he moved around right after he caught it as if it was a live play and the Ivy League players followed suit So from the 20, this is complete across the middle and a big pickup of over 30 yards goes Ricky Matsui. And the six foot two, 194 pounder makes the grab and Japan is immediately set up in Ivy territory. Well, they're showing in this second half, they're gonna come out firing empty set here, five wide for Masamoto, clean pocket. And we saw this, big plays in the first half, go up tempo, try and keep this Ivy League defense off balance. They ran that play so quickly, it was almost like they were trying to avoid a, any sort of replay. But obviously that last play was going to stand inside of midfield on the Ivy League side. Second down here for Masamoto, the lefty quarterback from the 38. Need to get to the 34, and this is in and out of the hands of Subasa Brennan. 
He's born in Hawaii, but he is considered a Japanese uh, domestic player, not a foreign athlete. He plays for the Panasonic Impulse. He went to university in Japan at Waseda University. And it's third and four. Ivy League could stand to hold serve here. Masamoto pressured out, gets away from Aubrey. Still lies upfield. Masamoto darts down just shy of where he needed to get to. He makes something out of nothing. It's not the first time he's done that today, Tyler. Yeah, he's comfortable, especially rolling left. And to turn that into a positive play, this is four down territory. Past the 40, fourth and short. And this play could have easily been blown up for negative yards, but a great job by Masamoto. Stays in there, good coverage down the field by the Ivy League, really nothing to look at, but turning a negative into a positive. We saw Koji Noso hit a 51-yard field goal from a very similar spot on the field in the first half, but on fourth down, the Japanese squad and Hiroshi Yamamoto elect to go for it. It's a run, and it won't get there. Ethan Royer, the former Brown Bear, makes the stop, and it's a turnover on downs. Royer just surveying the left tackle, flushes to the right, and this leaves things wide open at the edge of the play for Royer. Blows it up. Japan being aggressive there. We mentioned how Noso has that big leg, has shown that he can make from this distance, but Japan Trying to build a little bit of a cushion. Good stop from the Ivy League. Royer, one of James Perry's personal favorites. He says, you know, it's been really fun to watch him develop in his fifth year with Brown and see the player that he's become. He was one of Brown's captains. And now a run for Howard. Trying to navigate through the carnage there. Won't be a big pickup as a host of Japanese players, including one who loses his helmet, have to bring him down. Player who lost his helmet for Japan was Kenichiro Imoto. Yeah, that's what you need to do against Nick Howard. He makes a couple miss, but what you need to do defensively, just buy time. If you can't make the stop yourself, just give it an opportunity where you can get some teammates there. It was a gang tackle from Japan. Injury timeout. This is Hiroki Takaguchi, who is favoring his right elbow. And he was an important piece on defense for the Fujitsu Frontiers. He was an all-X League player. He tied for the league league with three interceptions. See if we can get a look at number 14 for Japan as they try and bring down Howard. It was Keishi Itashiki who was there initially with the hit. And then Emoto lost his helmet. So Takaguchi comes off the field, and it was only a pickup of about a yard. Second and let's call it eight and a half. <laughs> Howard gives it to Mulatu, and he will make it a third and manageable. Mulatu from Springfield, Virginia. Former high school football captain at John Lewis High School. His 2022 season, he ran for over 300 yards. And now it's third. Uh, they give him a first down, actually, on that carry. Just got enough for it. And Howard, on the run, completes it to Sutton on the right side. Hayes Sutton, in his Brown career, played in 29 games, caught 119 passes, over 1,100 yards receiving, and 10 touchdowns. He graduated from Brown last May with a degree in business, entrepreneur, and organizational studies. He's currently pursuing a master's in business at Duke. And here's another run, and that ball popped out at the end. Mulatu, Japanese team claiming that they have possession. We're waiting for an official signal, but Mulatu at the end of that play saying he was down. Let's see if the officials agree. You mentioned how ball security had been so important in this game as the officials going to get together to talk this one over. This would be a huge call as the Ivy League was starting to get things going. And 
It's kind of been the story. If this goes to Team Japan, where as soon as the Ivy League does something successful on offense, they just can't build on it. James Perry interested on the sideline. What is the call? Also a flag down, as you see. So interestingly, they do rule that Mulatu was down, but the run won't count. It's Trevor Radicevic, the center, who's called for the unnecessary roughness. Let's take a look at the back end of this play. Ball definitely comes out. Yeah, no mention of that whatsoever. And you pretty easy call there on Radicevic as he just wrapped up an OA. Brought him down and then it had an extra shove for him. And again, these penalties just demoralizing for the Ivy League. Whenever they start trending in the right direction, start to sustain a drive, a big penalty puts them behind the sticks. Second and 18 now for the Ivy offense, all the way back at their own 40 yard line. Need to get inside the 45 of the Japanese team. Howard sets up a screen to Edwards. Breaks one tackle, but cannot evade another Japanese player. Yohei Komiya was the one who tied him up. And Komiya makes sure that that did not turn into a big gainer. Could have been. And the thing, too, with that unnecessary roughness happening during the course of the play, it wasn't a dead ball foul, so it backs them up in what was that second and long, which turns into a third and long. Ivy coaches wanted to get some clarification there from the officiating crew. And hey, we got some Brown fans and Columbia fans in attendance. Good to have some representation on both sides. Making the long road trip. Howard on third down. It's caught by Sutton across midfield. Spins his way for a Ivy League first down to the 41-yard line. And Hayes Sutton. Thrilled to be wearing that brown helmet once again. And again, we had mentioned his name in the first half. Just waiting for him to get more involved. He knows this James Perry offense. He's a threat. Averaged just under five catches per game in 2022. He is someone who is in and around the ball, likes to be a playmaker. Brown this past season, three and four in the Ivy League. They tied Penn for fifth place. They were five and five overall. And a big step up to that Bears program. Certainly on the rise. Cut back, Edwards, only a yard there. He's finally bowled over. In on the tackle, Shota Ione, who contributed three and a half tackles and a losing cause for the Panasonic Impulse in the Rice Bowl earlier this month. Yeah, Brown just trending forward and just shows you that there is no easy game. There had been a few years in a row where Brown was in the basement of the Ivy League, but they are taking a big step under James Perry, someone who has so much pride for this program, a program that he was the quarterback of. Howard gives it. And again, a modest pickup, only a yard or two to Roper, sets up for a third down and close to six here. So we're past the midway point in the third quarter. Japan scored a touchdown on its opening drive of the game and then kicked a 51-yard field goal, the Ivy League's best drive ended inside the 10-yard line and led to a 22-yard boot from Jackson Kennedy. Now this third and medium play call is going to tell you a lot about what the Ivy League's thinking at this spot of the field. If they go for a conservative play, get a couple of yards, four down territory where they try and get it all right here. Needing to get to the 32. That's Nick LeBoy in motion. They go in his direction. LeBoy gets dragged down, only gets to the 35-yard line. The tackle from Kenichiro Emoto, who earlier on this drive lost his helmet, comes back in, makes the tackle. Fourth, and you'd imagine the Ivy Leaguers will go for it. Yeah, maybe just a yard on the play. Are they trying to set up the tunnel screen for LeBoy and J.J. Jenkins just came up empty on a block in the offense, staying out there in fourth and four. Howard. He'll keep it rumbling ahead. Howard will be close. And Nick Howard looks like he is right at the marker. 
This will come down to the spot here, but that's a position that Sammy McCorkle and, of course, the late great buddy Tevens would put Nick Howard in more often than not, and he would always seem to come through. Yeah, he's a bulldozer. He is a short yardage type guy, just that big frame that he possesses, 6'2", 225, someone that is good through contact, and this is a huge call upcoming. Referees coming together. Might test the integrity of that chain that snapped off earlier in the first quarter. And it looks like they are going to bring out the chains to measure this critical call here, whether or not this Ivy League drive will continue. Well, over the course of this week after the Ivy delegation arrived on January 14th and 15th, they spent the balance of their time preparing for the game along with a lot of cultural and educational events. They planned to visit the historical city of Kamakura. They visited the United States Embassy and interacted with Ivy alumni, had discussion with Japanese students, social exchanges with the Japanese team. It's really been a huge undertaking. And it will be an Ivy League first down here as you see the measurement just enough, half the football, but you know, this week is more than just this game, and it really is a, a, a massive undertaking and a wonderful experience for the student athletes, the coaching staffs, all the support staff as well. On well, that video to start, I think just the perspective you get from the Ivy League players shows you everything. They know how much this experience means, just experiencing a new culture, and then you just think about the amount of Ivy League alumni that are prominent international business, Japan, Tokyo, and China as well, so also networking opportunities. Howard going for the end zone, and he overcooks his target. Allen Houston, the third, the former Brown wide receiver, the intended target. Houston played last season at Louisville. Of course, the son of the former NBA great. So second and 10 for Nick Howard and company. Oh, fine with that. Good play call on first and 10. Try and take a shot. Try and get a big pass play down the field. From the 32, he'll keep it himself. Breaks through one tackle, and Japanese linebackers are ready for him. That time it was that defensive back, Hiroki Takaguchi. Remember, he had the arm that he was favoring. He comes back into the game to help make the tackle. Key guy, part of... Coach Yamamoto's secondary. Been really impressed by the discipline of this Japanese defense when Howard has gone with these option plays. They have not overcommitted. They don't bite on the fakes. Howard's going to get his yards. We know that. But limiting him has been big. He's going deep again for Houston, and it's incomplete, but a penalty flag. <laughs> Coverage coming from... Al Rawan Adeyemi, 33 year old from Santa Monica, California, the most decorated American football player in Japan with eight X League titles since coming over. Adeyemi had experience trying out for the Giants and the Detroit Lions after college, went to the University of San Diego and came over and has been a, really at the, the first seat of this Fujitsu dynasty. There was a really good feature on NFL Network about him a few weeks ago that you can watch on YouTube, but, you know, fantastic story. And he had an opportunity when he came over to Japan. He was given a, a call from... In the round, defense number 40, 50 yard penalty, Ottawa's first up. So... Adeyemi called for the penalty, but he was given a call right as the Japanese season was about to start. Hey, Detroit Lions, we're interested in you again. Can you come over and, and try out for us? It was not a sure thing. And he said, I made the commitment to Japan, and I want to see it through. And he has not left as a pro football player. As This is knocked around and out of bounds, hauled in. And I think he was out of bounds on this play. It was... Wiseman Moses Kaito, defensive back who makes the interception but out of bounds. And that last play for Adeyemi, you can read his lips, is a couple yards out of bounds as he leaped up and 
said he's grabbing me, pleading his case that Allen Houston was grabbing him, initiated the contact as Houston tried to acrobatically get around. But one of those situations where if your eyes aren't on the football, you're always going to get called. On second down, it's Mulatu changing direction. Nothing there. It's Takaguchi. Showing why he was an all-ex-league defensive back. If he doesn't make this stop, this is six for the Ivy League because you have Nick Howard as a lead blocker. What a great job wrapping up from the ankles and not letting Milatu get away. He shakes that free again. Howard is right there, and it is a parade to the end zone for the Ivy League for the first time. The Ivy League has had a hard time breaking through with long runs. There's always seemingly been a player there for Japan to prevent a true breakout. On third down, Howard starts to run. Howard eyes toward the end zone, and he's knocked out of bounds right at the marker. It should be another first down, and this time goal to go from inside the five-yard line for the Ivy League. Once again, third down. Who else do you want with the ball in his hands but Nick Howard? Just such a competent runner. When he gets downhill, he is tough to stop, and this time showing his ability not just in between the tackles, getting to the edge and getting out in space. At the three, Mulatu, the handoff, nothing there. You know, in case you're curious, how big are some of these players on the defensive line for Japan? The starting defensive line, the answer is not particularly big. You've got Masao Uda, 247 pounds. Uh, Kosuke Kamiyama, 236 pounds. Taisuke Miyagawa, 231 pounds. And then you've got Jabari Williams at 245. So not necessarily a big group up front, but they're holding serve against an Ivy League offensive line that averages right about 300 pounds. Yeah, more linebacker builds from that defensive line. Second and goal, back at the five. This time the handoff to Edwards. Knifes through one hole, but gets no further than the two. And again, the push from that Japanese defensive line is enough. It's not all about size when it comes to playing in the trenches. This Japanese defense, we mentioned their discipline has really stood out. They are very gap conscious. There's not many holes. They have not allowed many big plays. And also a good supporting cast as well. One guy, if he doesn't make the stop, he's doing enough to get some teammates over and gang tackle. Third and goal. And it's Howard lunging forward, but he's a yard shy. Yuichiro Kushida makes the tackle. It looked like that was opening up for a Nick Howard touchdown, but the hole closed. He yeah, was the last layer of defense, and this play was almost blown up in the backfield as well. Howard was able to tuck it. That was one of the times that Japan is overcommitted on the option. Fourth and goal from the one. Ivy League looking to tie it up. Howard. Gives it, Edwards at the goal line. He won't get there. Japan stands firm. And that undersized defensive line, they have the passion and the drive to hold off the Ivy League. Kyosuke Kamiyama of the Fujitsu Frontiers helps makes the goal line stop and it stays 10-3. That was just a battle of wills right there. Tyson Edwards, the yard to get, stood up right at the goal line. Now in this turnover here, Japan, they got to get a couple of yards. It is not a comfortable position to be in, right in your own end zone. So they will take a look at it, but it did not appear that Edwards got to the goal line, got back to the line of scrimmage, but it didn't look like he got anywhere further on that, that first glance. It kind of tells it all with the last layer of defense from Japan, the linebackers, they were set up right at the goal line, and they were not penetrated whatsoever, not even backed up a little bit. They were the ones that set the edge on Tyson Edwards. It looked like Shota Aone 
was one of the players there, and I think this should be a quick review because he was stood up at the goal line. You can get this angle, but you just see pursuit starts in the backfield, and then yeah, the ball's not extended whatsoever. He has to keep that tight to his body. It is Aona, and just a great job one-on-one -on -one with a running back barreling down on you. Good size at Edwards, too, 5'11", 210. Shota Aone, 5'10", 214 pounds. And so, like college, they review it upstairs, and then we'll get the word sent down. But didn't see anything on first or second viewing that would make it, in our minds, think that this call is going to be changed. And I'm sure that there's a little bit of remorse on that Ivy sideline. But they didn't call Nick Howard's number, a guy with 34 career rushing touchdowns. After the review, kneeling on the field is stunned. Therefore, Team Japan first down. And there you hear it. And that's a massive stop in this game. You're thinking. You said it. Uh, we've seen the brotherly shove this year be automatic. Nick Howard at the goal line is automatic. One of the best in Dartmouth history scoring in short distance situations now. Here are the Ivy League. You think Japan's going to try and get a couple yards here on the ground. Send the house. Send some pressure. Clog the gaps. Japan will operate out of the shotgun with Masamoto. And then Grant off to his left. Grant has the game's only touchdown, and he will be driven back into the end zone. It looked like he got out of the end zone. And so the clock will tick under 30 seconds, and again, more of that chippiness. Get a little bit more of that this year than last year. Told you how personally the Japanese team took the defeat to the Ivies last year. And they were as motivated as ever. We'll see if that becomes the final play of the third quarter. And you know, we say that it's a massive stop that Japan had on the Ivy League. We saw last year the Ivy League eat up half of a quarter with one drive. Time can get milked off the clock quickly, especially in these conditions where teams are running the football more often than not. Yeah, and so far so good for the Ivy League. You get that first stop on the first down play and Japan is set up in the same exact situation. Ivy League needs to win the battle at the line of scrimmage right now because Japan trying to go with some quick hitters, get a couple yards. Went that time for Samaje Grant for no gain, but Japan is still very much backed up. And yes, you're thinking safety in this area, but even if you don't get it, it's still the field position that you can get. A little bit of the history of American football in Japan. It was formally introduced in 1934 by 